Today we will begin briefly in the Colorado River, and this is a, a photograph of the Colorado River uh, downstream of Lee's Ferry, so downstream of the current location of Glen Canyon Dam, and into the horizon you see it entering uh, the Grand Canyon area. And one of the things I want to think about today is uh, uh, what in the world could be responsible for carving such a, a magnificent canyon? And what is, what's involved in creating this landscape? Uh, and this was one of the problems that John Wesley Powell was, uh, was, was very interested in. What are the forces that are responsible? And one of the things that John <coughs> Wesley Powell was, uh, was keenly interested in was a scientific approach uh, to problems related to landscape. Uh, and that contrasted with, uh, um, with um, some of the prevailing views of the 19th century. And those views took uh, the Colorado River as it entered uh, Grand Canyon and said, well, the forces that, that, that shape this canyon are cataclysmic forces. Um, and in fact, most likely, they're the product of the Great Flood. And so as John Wesley Powell looked at landscape features like this, and as geologists in the 19th century looked at landscape features like this, there are really two uh, diametrically opposite views of what can shape these landscapes. Uh, there is the view that it's shaped by, uh, by some cataclysmic event, um, and not just any cataclysmic event usually, uh, it's shaped by the Great Flood. And in fact, much of geology in the 19th century uh, much of mainstream geology looked at interpreting landscape features in terms of uh, those that were left behind by, by, those, uh, by those biblical events. Um, John Wesley Powell and uh, geologists of the 19th century developed a contrasting view, uh, and the contrasting view uh, falls under the title of uniformitarianism, and the basic, uh, the basic premise is that if we look at geologic features today, the, the geologic features that we see today were, were created by processes uh, that um, happened in the past when they were created. They are happening today, uh, and they will happen in the future. And John Wesley Powell and others uh, introduced uniformitarianism as a view uh, in uh, contrast and in contradiction to uh, uh, catastrophism, uh, which uh, interpreted features of the landscape in terms of uh, <coughs> cataclysmic events, and in particular in terms of, uh, of the Great Flood. So these are the, these are the two principal uh, ideas uh, that shaped thinking about uh, features of the landscape. Now, we're, we're going to switch our, um, our uh, setting somewhat now to the Pacific Northwest, um, and we're going to look around Grand Coulee Dam. Grand Coulee Dam, uh, one of the great uh, structures that we'll be talking about uh, in lecture and in precept for several weeks, uh, located on the Columbia River 
uh, in Washington State. This is in fact a, a picture of Grand Coulee Dam. We are without reds today, so colors are going to appear uh, a bit funny in places, and my uh, interpretation will have to guide you in places where uh, reds are supposed to appear. Um, <coughs> so Grand Coulee Dam uh, on the Columbia River, well, Grand Coulee isn't going to be the topic today. Uh, Coulee, does, does anyone know what a coulee is? Coulee, it, it, you know, it's actually pretty si simple. It's just a dry valley. Um, and you know what? What in the world gives you a dry valley? Um, well, I'm going to give you. My gosh, we've got reds now. Oh no, I've got reds. You don't have. Reds. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> well, we don't have reds. Uh, we've got a map of. Um, we've got a, a, a red, green, blue image. Uh, without the red uh, of the state of Washington and surrounding areas. And I'll, so here's the boundary of Washington State with Canada uh, at the top. Uh, the things that we'll be looking at is we're, we're going to be looking at features of the Columbia River. Now the Columbia River comes down from Canada and enters, uh, well, and here is the confluence with the Spokane River that comes from Idaho, uh, west to east, east to west, uh, into Washington State. Uh, Grand Coulee Dam is located here. This feature here we'll be looking at, this is uh, the Dry Falls and the Dry Falls Dam, and then the Colorado River flows around like so, uh, into the Pacific. Uh, this is the Columbia Gorge area, Wallula Gap we'll be looking at. The Snake River, which flows up from Idaho, um, into Washington State and then joins the uh, Columbia River just uh, upstream of Wallula Gap, which is located here, we'll be looking at in some detail. Now, um, what this, uh, with, with the red in particular, what this image shows is um, it's a satellite image just using different uh, portions of the electromagnetic spectrum to look at what the surface is made of. Uh, and some of the things that it's made of are going to be really important to our story. This big area here is referred to as the Columbia Basin, uh, and it was largely constructed uh, six to around 20 million years ago uh, by uh, uh, massive uh, basalt flows from volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so we have this area that's uh, overlain by volcanoes, uh, the Cascades uh, to the west, the Blue Mountains, ah, the Blue Mountains uh, to the south, the Okanagans to the north, and then the Rocky Mountains to the east, so bounded on all sides uh, by uh, mountain ranges. Our focus then is going to be in the Columbia Plateau. Um, now the, the areas that show up in, in white here um, are areas that were formed uh, mainly by uh, wind-blown material that was eroded from the mountains to the north from the Okanagans. Uh, so we've got uh, the Cascades which are made up of uh, in the eastern portion of uh, really old igneous rocks. Um, on top of those are these basalt flows, and then on top of the basalt flows is this really thick uh, layer uh, of wind-blown sediment that's come from the north. Uh, so that's the setting in which the Columbia River uh, is formed, and it's the setting which we'll be looking at, um, at um, uh, what the Columbia River has done uh, over the last, well, several thousand years. So that's the setting. Now looking back to uh, Grand Coulee Dam, so again here's the dam, and now we're just going to uh, look a bit around at some of the surroundings which are really strange. Um, now it's, located, it's noted here that we've got these areas of basalts, uh, we've got sort of granites uh, underneath them, so the basalt flows went on top of the granites. And then even Steamboat Rock out here um, is an area where you've got a little bit of that, um, that uh, loess, that windblown sediment that's on top of the basalt sticking out. Uh, so we're, we're going to be looking at a really funny <coughs> landscape. I'm going to look at it now from a perspective of Dry Falls Dam, which extends uh, really here into the, uh, in the south of the picture. And Dry Falls Dam is created uh, by pumping water up from uh, the lake behind uh, Grand Coulee into an, a lake at higher elevations. So this is a picture of Dry Falls Dam uh, at Grand Coulee. So Grand Coulee Dam now is to the, uh, 
uh, to the bottom of the picture, um, and we're looking uh, we're looking to the south here, uh, toward the central portion uh, of the Columbia Basin. So Dry Falls Dam. Dry Falls Dam was the um, uh, was a, a major storage facility for irrigation of the Columbia Plateau. And the basic idea was that uh, you were going to grow tremendous amounts of wheat by irrigating uh, the arid lands of the Columbia Basin. And the, so the Dry Falls Dam was an important part of that and, and part of the story that we'll be looking at over the next several weeks. But it's really not the story for today, and it's not the dam story, but it's the Dry Falls story uh, that we're going to be looking at today. So Dry Falls, I'm going to be looking now uh, to the south, and uh, up in the image here is to the south, and well, here's uh, Dry Falls. You can see in the top of the image, uh, the very southern end of uh, the Dry Falls storage facility, uh, and then well, here's Dry Falls. Now, uh, for scale, this is about three miles wide, um, and it's about a, a thousand foot drop here. So, and, and there's no water flowing over it uh, at all. It's three miles wide, and it's about a, you know, a thousand uh, feet high. Um, and the story that we're going to be dealing with principally here is a story that was initiated in 1923 uh, by a geologist named uh, J. Harlan Bretz. And what Brett said is that you know, this feature was created by a cataclysmic flood. Um, and he made, that, uh, he made that observation, and he published that conclusion, uh, and he was subject to intense ridicule. And not just ridicule, but what was being attacked here was the very foundation of science. And in fact, you can look at um, at, at, uh, at creation web pages today. Uh, I looked at several this morning, and you'll find, uh, you'll find references to J. Harlan Bretz throughout. So what J. Harlan Bretz claimed was this feature of the landscape, it was created by cataclysmic flood, uh, not by the processes that geologists uh, really like to think about. Uh, you know, glaciation was one that they identified in the, in the, in the 19th century as responsible for many of these, these big valley and, and features of, uh, of river uh, channels, uh, carved by glaciers. Now there's some problems with the glacier here. One is that if you had a glacier creating this, you know, why would you get such a sharp drop? So there are were, there were all kinds of problems. Um, Bretz was, uh, was largely ostracized from the geologic community, but he continued over a period of 20 years uh, just amassing evidence. And uh, so there, there, there are these, uh, there are these uh, what are called erratics, the size of large houses, just sitting in the middle of the, uh, of the Columbia Basin. I mean, well, how did they get there? Um, you know, rafting by, by glaciers uh, just didn't quite uh, do the trick here. So you have to you have to have to come up with some other explanation. Is, just a, is this just a little pebble in a big flood? That was what uh, J. Harlan Bl uh, Bretz claimed. Now, uh, this is looking um, in the Columbia River downstream of, um, of Grand Coulee before it joins with the Snake River, close to its confluence with the Snake. It's a big river here. You see a town over uh, on the... On the on the west bank of the river. Um, now the thing that I hope you can see is, do you see these ripple marks? Can you see the ripple marks? Uh, here's the channel, here is the floodplain of the river. Um, another 50 feet up, you reach this surface, the ripples are about 50 feet uh, in, uh, in elevation from top to bottom in amplitude. What in the world created that? Well, again, Bretz argued that it was a flood that filled this entire uh, valley bottom uh, up to a depth of close to uh, 500 feet. Uh, a cataclysmic flood. Now, um, and looking around, this is, uh, so that was in the, uh, the valley of the Columbia River. This is just in the middle uh, of the Columbia Basin. There's no big river anywhere around. Just uh, right in between the Columbia uh, and the snake, well, and I have to tell you what you've got here. Again, uh, you get these, uh, these dune forms. Uh, these are, I have to give you, they're uh, about 50 feet in amplitude, and their spacing is about 500 feet 
one to the next. And they're made up of uh, a gravel, cobble, and uh, very large material. So just sitting right in the middle of the Columbia Basin. Again, what in the world could have done this well, if not uh, a cataclysmic flood? So those were the um, features uh, that that's observed. Uh, the Palouse River flows into the Snake River about 50 miles upstream of its confluence uh, with, the, uh, with the Columbia River. Uh, spectacular waterfalls and valleys that are carved with little teeny tiny streams in them compared to the size of the channel that's been carved out by this thing. So something, something created this enormous valley, uh, but it's not there now. There's just you know, sort of a little teeny tiny uh, river at the bottom of it. Again, these were the features that, uh, that Brett's observed. Now the, the, the problem, uh, Brett's had all of these features, and they really, if, if, we, if he had had uh, an airplane or a satellite, he would have been able to uh, to make his case convincingly in the, in the 1920s, but he really had neither. Uh, so he didn't have this aerial view of these features. He mapped them from the surface. Um, this is uh, another of the uh, features. This is from Dry Falls Dam, uh, river extending all the way down to the Columbia, just a series of potholes and plunge pools. Now the final uh, piece of evidence that uh, that Brett's uh, symbol was uh, a mapping of, uh, uh, of what he termed the channeled scab land. And the channeled scab land is this area where, uh, on the one hand, you have rolling topography that's covered by this, uh, by this uh, windblown sediment, loess, and uh, right adjacent to it, you're scoured down to basalt. So what he mapped was this series of apparent channels where the, uh, where the loess had been eroded away um, and uh, what was remaining was uh, what he uh, characterized as relic channels from a great flood in which uh, all of the material had been eroded down to this uh, highly uh, resistant <coughs> basalt. The evidence uh, that Bretz wasn't able to, or that Bretz didn't, uh, put in place was the evidence that what created uh, the Mo Missoula floods was a dam failure. Uh, and boy, was it a big dam failure. And it was a dam that was created during the last ice age, and it was an ice dam. Uh, the ice dam, so the, uh, what's termed the Cordilleran ice sheet, uh, penetrated from the north and its uh, southeastern lobe, uh, dammed up the Clark Fork River and formed. Uh, what's called Glacial Lake Missoula. Um, it's, uh, can, uh, the lake now is, uh, contains what is uh, present-day Missoula, Montana. Uh, the ice dam uh, was more than uh, 2,000 feet high, and it impounded more than 500 cubic miles of water. Just a massive, massive dam. Now, um, the final piece of information that came in the 1940s uh, was a series uh, of shoreline uh, deposits from Glacial Lake Missoula. Brett's hadn't thought to look up uh, and find a source, the source of the tremendous amount of water that's needed to create uh, the flood features he observed in the Columbia Basin. Um, and in the 1950s, uh, a series of shoreline deposits uh, were marked that identified um, the elevations, the elevations, plural, um, of Glacial Lake Missoula. Now, the, the picture that emerged here is not one in which uh, you have an ice lobe dam the Clark Fork River and then it fails. That's not what happened. In fact, what happened is there were between 50 and 100 uh, major uh, flood episodes in which there was filling uh, and breaching of the ice dam. Uh, so there are this series of shoreline levels that mark the elevations of Glacial Lake Missoula uh, during this series of, uh, of periods of inundation uh, and then subsequent dam failure. Now, so the, the features that we see now is we have an ice dam that forms right along the Idaho-Washington uh, border. Uh, we have an ice sheet that extends down uh, and in fact blocks uh, what is the current channel of the Columbia River and diverts it down the dry falls. So the entire Columbia River now 
uh, is not flowing for at uh, the time of uh, the Lake Missoula floods was not flowing in its current channel, but it was flowing through uh, dry falls. And this entire central portion uh, of, uh, of eastern um, Washington was inundated by, uh, by tremendous floods. Depths, uh, uh, the flood wave leaving the ice dam uh, over 2,000 feet, uh, flood depths over 500 feet, over much, uh, much of uh, central Washington. So a cataclysmic flood, by gosh, that certainly uh, is a cataclysmic flood. Um, so the evidence, uh, the, uh, the evidence is, uh, is overwhelming in terms of uh, both the, uh, the mechanism that carved the landscape of the Columbia Plateau um, and, the, uh, and the Columbia River, um, and also of the source of the water, uh, Glacial Lake Missoula being the source. Now, uh, one of the, I, I mentioned the lake levels in, um, uh, that were mapped uh, in Glacial Lake Missoula. Um, another piece of uh, important information, <coughs> looking downstream, uh, Bretz's term uh, for the Lake Missoula floods was the Spokane flood. He envisioned a, a single great flood instead of a series of floods. And what's shown here is uh, the series uh, uh, flood deposits uh, near Wallula Gap, which is downstream of the confluence between the Snake and the Columbia River. Now, this, uh, this is uh, slack water deposits, so slack water deposits. Um, so you have tremendous velocities associated with the, uh, with the, with the flow and a flood like um, uh, what must have occurred in, uh, in the Columbia Plateau. But you find that you have areas um, on the periphery of the flow in which you have low velocities. And those low velocity areas of flow are areas in which you're going to have deposition of sediment. And so what's, uh, what's seen here is in one of the low velocity areas close to Wallula Gap, you've got this tremendous record uh, of the 50 to 100 floods that occurred uh, around uh, 16,000 to 12,000 years ago uh, from, uh, from the filling and breaching of uh, Glacial Lake Missoula. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's kind of neat. There's, um, there's some more dating that you can do there. There are, two, um, there are two ash deposits. And the two ash deposits are, uh, are associated with two periods of eruption of Mount St. Helen. Um, so you can find uh, deposits here uh, at Wallula Gap uh, and you can compare them to deposits that you find in the Columbia Gorge and that you find in other locations. So you have this nice way of, uh, you've got this record uh, of, uh, of flooding that occurred. This is kind of neat. Now, um, it, it's neat and it, uh, it's interesting, it's really uh, fascinating detective story stuff. Um, and it also turns out it's really the way the Bureau of Reclamation now is thinking about uh, dealing with the problem of assessing uh, the occurrence of extreme floods. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of the ways that they are uh, pursuing as a way of, uh, um, of, uh, of monitoring extreme floods is through deposits like these. Now, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey uh, was not organized 10,000 years ago. And if we want records of, uh, that characterize extreme floods on the time scales, uh, that are important for our design considerations, like designing spillways, uh, designing other elements of the dam uh, that are essential uh, to its safe operation. You know, we need to we need to be able to characterize uh, how often uh, extreme floods occur. So this is uh, this is kind of neat detective stuff. It's also translated into uh, some of the the, the principal methodology uh, that's being used to try and uh, get around the fact that we only have you know, 50 to 100 years of observations. Let's come up with, uh, we, can't, we can't really go much more than 10,000 years uh, in, in any location because we get back into that glacial uh, business and we know that things were very different uh, uh, during the glacial period. Okay, so this, was, uh, this is another piece of the evidence uh, that uh, in fact what happened um, during the last ice age was this series of, uh, of tremendous floods that carved the features of the Columbia Plateau. Still blue here, okay. 
So now, um, if we look again at our um, at our um, image uh, from satellite, um, the thing that uh, that J. Harlan Bretz would have just been amazed to see is from space these channels. You see these channels. Now this is uh, it, it comes out a different color because uh, the gray area here is basalt. It's where you uh, you've eroded down to the basalt. The white are going to be the areas covered by the loess. Uh, so there are these tremendous channels that form. And here, uh, the Rathrum Prairie just downstream of, uh, of Spokane, downstream at least for the, uh, for the Lake Missoula floods. Uh, so from space, or in fact from, uh, from, uh, from an airplane, uh, you get this, this tr uh, amazing picture uh, of the channels that formed uh, during the flooding uh, when the Lake Missoula dams failed. Uh, here is the, the Dry Falls Dam. So this was the channel of the Columbia River uh, 16,000 years ago. And it had two main courses, this course down to the potholes and then this course uh, over the, to the Columbia as the ice sheet uh, uh, retracted uh, later in, the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the end of the Ice Age. Um, so this, uh, this depiction of the uh, formation of channels um, is not uh, representative of what we see today, uh, this is essentially a very dry area with no channels. Uh, the Palouse River, that uh, waterfall, uh, drains um, into the Snake River uh, right uh, before its confluence with the Columbia, but it's a very tiny stream uh, today. So this is, the, this is the picture that emerges from the um, flooding from Lake Missoula. This is a, um, this is a picture from, uh, uh, from the space shuttle in which you can see this is again just uh, to the south of Dry Falls. You see the old channel of the Columbia River and then these abandoned uh, channels or channels in which you have these enormous valleys or coolies, dry valleys, uh, with uh, either no uh, channel in them at all uh, or very, very small uh, stream channels. Okay, so what we're going to do now is um, we're just going to step down the Columbia River a bit and take a look at some of the, uh, of the observations that we can make. Um, it's, um, it's, it's really nice to be able to, uh, to solve the detective story uh, that, that Brett's uh, initially posed. Um, it's also uh, very important for solving this other problem, being able to, uh, to quantify uh, the magnitude of flooding. So we're going to look at um, at some computations uh, that you can carry out uh, for flooding, computations that were carried out, and how they could, uh, they could be done. And um, be begin by just looking at um, evidence around Wallula Gap. It's a constriction in the river, or a constriction in the valley bottom. Uh, it expands uh, below Wallula Gap and then constricts again uh, when the river passes through the Cascades, through the Columbia Gorge. So a picture of Wallula Gap. Uh, so we have a, uh, the river now flowing through um, um, a valley bottom with well, terraces on either side and then very, very high, 500-foot uh, high cliffs. 500-foot uh, <coughs> high cliffs were in fact breached by the flood. This is uh, looking downstream through the constriction. And it's kind of hard to, s to see here, but you can see how um, material has just been eroded away uh, from the constricted portions of the channel. Um, and what can be mapped from these, or you can map where, um, uh, where erosion has dramatically changed the form of the landscape, and you can kind of map it um, all the way up and down the sides of the, of the canyon. There's uh, a variety of types of information uh, so these very large boulders that appear, these are uh, boulders that were deposited by the river. Uh, one of the nice things that you know is if you've got a, you know, if you've got a boulder sitting here, the river is down there now, um, well the river was up here uh, during the Lake Missoula flood. So you've got, uh, you've got a flood mark. Uh, in particular what you've got is you know that the elevation of the water surface was higher than that point. Um, so what's been done is uh, uh, through mapping of erosional features and depositional features 
uh, like this large boulder, uh, you can come up with a map of uh, elevation of the water surface. One other piece, so I mentioned the channel scab land. Um, you can look at divides that were crossed and those that were not crossed. So if the, uh, if the windblown sediments are still in place, then you know that these ridges were not exceeded in magnitude and all this area in which you've scoured down the salt is areas of flood. So again, uh, you've got a, uh, a mechanism, you've got a tool, an observation tool for mapping uh, where the flood was and what its maximum elevation was. Now looking down into the uh, Columbia River Gorge, this is a very, very high gradient portion uh, of the Columbia River. Um, before I proceed too much further. So uh, let me just mention another important uh, point uh, for at least the current day uh, situation uh, and one that deals with uh, what uh, Washington gives and Oregon takes. Uh, Washington gave uh, an awful lot of topsoil. So all of this windblown uh, sediment is really high quality um, uh, farming material uh, that was eroded. Um, well, much of it is deposited in the Pacific, but the Willamette Valley has about uh, 100 feet of sediment that was deposited from these floods. So the Willamette Valley is now an important agricultural region, largely because of these uh, flood deposits from Lake Missoula. Now looking at the Columbia Gorge, uh, passing through the Cascades, a very high gradient uh, portion of the river, And this is a set of observations <coughs> that was collected by the U.S. Geological Survey where uh, in the wide open triangles they're showing elevations at which um, the flood did not exceed that point. And then in the filled triangles these are elevations at which the flood did exceed that stage. So if you have, um, if you have uh, boulders, if you have erosional features, if you have slack water deposits, you know that the flood has exceeded the level that you're at. Um, if you have the, um, uh, the uh, loess, the windblown sediment, uneroded, then you know that the flood hasn't reached that level. Um, it would all be uh, taken away if the flood had. So um, what's mapped here is, um, in a downstream direction, uh, basically the elevation of the surface of the, uh, of the flood from, uh, from Lake Azula flooding down through or down to Portland and here through the uh, Columbia River Gorge. Okay, so what if, let's see, what can we do now? Um, from these high water marks, uh, we've got a downstream profile of uh, the elevation of the, uh, of the flood. Okay. Now, we can, we, we, can, we can go out there now and you know, just survey the, uh, the cross-section of the valley. You know, so we know it was this high, we can, you know, we can get the, the cross-section. Uh, so we've got, uh, we've got the cross-sectional profile of the channel, and we've got the slope of the water surface. All we need now is a roughness coefficient and we're ready to go. Uh, Manning's equation uh, and we compute velocity. So that's a problem that you're going to in fact work on for homework is computing discharge for the Lake Missoula flows uh, using Manning's equation. Now the, the observations are basically from these, you know, these boulders, these maps of where, uh, where, uh, uh, where uh, boundaries, drainage divides were crossed and where they weren't, uh, slack water deposits from the series of, uh, of, uh, of observations of either exceedance or non-exceedance by the floods. Okay, so that's what gives us the water surface slope. We go in and we make some pretty heroic assumptions about uh, what was in the channel and what wasn't in the channel uh, during the flooding. We've got cross-sectional area. Um, well, Manning's coefficients. Let me just show you some some answers uh, that the U.S. Geological Survey came up with. Now this is, 
uh, discharge, discharge in millions of cubic meters per second. Okay, and uh, so cubic meters per second, uh, about 30 uh, cubic feet per second. So hundreds of millions of cubic feet per second much, much bigger than anything the Mississippi River has ever seen. Um, now, I'll just look at the so highest Missoula flood evidence. And then this just shows, well, um, they picked a roughness coefficient and they looked 75% smaller and 25% uh, smaller. Well, the flood magnitude ranges between 9 and 10 uh, million cubic meters per second. I don't care if it's 9 or 10. It's just enormous. So the um, the, the answer here is not going to be overly sensitive to the, uh, to the roughness coefficient you specify. It's going to be very sensitive to, uh, to slopes and it's going to be very sensitive to cross-sectional area. Okay, so the, 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 the other important element that comes into play, so it's, uh, Brett's detective story is, is just fascinating material. Uh, but the other piece is that we've got a lot of information uh, about extreme floods. And when we look at flood hazards, our problem is, uh, is always characterizing uh, magnitudes and frequency of extreme floods. Uh, so this gives, us, uh, this gives us some interesting new tools for trying to, uh, to characterize magnitude and frequency of extreme floods. Now just to, just to give you a little bit of, uh, of context, this is, uh, this is just channel cross sections. This is in the, uh, in the center of the Columbia Basin, the Rathbrook Prairie. This is that area that's inundated downstream of Spokane, okay, in, the, in what's now essentially just a, uh, a, a, a dry uh, channelless uh, uh, region. So this is the channel there. Uh, this is one of the other um, uh, Missoula channels that's close to um, uh, the present day uh, Grand Coulee. Uh, and then some modern floods. Um, well, the Mississippi, you know, close to the 1927 flood, uh, our biggest, uh, the Amazon. So the Mississippi uh, here at three times 10 to the fourth cubic meters to per second compared to 2,000 times 10 to the fourth cubic meters per second uh, for the Lake Missoula flood to 30 times 10 to the fourth cubic meters per second for the Amazon. And then one of the uh, gorges in uh, the three gorges sequence uh, in the Yangtze, very different geometry, it is a gorge. Uh, that's uh, obvious. Um, 10 times 10 to the fourth cubic meters per second. As I just give you some perspective on, uh, on what we're talking about, this is a, this is a big, big flood. <coughs> now, the channelized scab land, so this is looking downstream of, of Poke, uh, Spokane. So from the type of flood evidence, uh, that was assembled, uh, basically what um, uh, Bretts and then uh, subsequent geologists were able to reconstruct was uh, not only the sequence of channels, uh, but discharge moving over the Columbia Basin uh, at peak discharge. Uh, so they have, they have this wonderful representation of, uh, of where and how much water uh, at, at, at the largest discharge from the Lake Missoula floods, uh, what they were. So the, um, the kind of summary characterizations of the Lake Missoula floods, uh, the timing we know pretty well, uh, 16 to 12,000 uh, years ago, and uh, that, that, that period doesn't just reflect the, uh, the, the, the time window in which we're estimating a flood to occur, it's a time window over which hundreds uh, of flood events occurred. Um, uh, Two and a half thousand cubic kilometers of water discharged, um, and then peak discharges as large as uh, 20 million cubic meters per second. So this is the this is certainly uh, the largest uh, documented flood on Earth. Um, and in fact, uh, from uh, scouring um, imagery like the ones I've showed you from satellite, uh, there's really no evidence of, of any flood. Uh, on Earth that uh, that uh, that really compares with the uh, with the uh, with the Missoula floods. Now um, I mentioned that it's uh, it, you know, it's uh, it's a, an important detective story. It's also an important 
way of looking at, um, um, at quantifying magnitude and frequency of floods. Um, in the, the Verde River Basin in central Arizona, uh, for a variety of uh, flood control proposals, uh, they just want to figure out how big extreme floods can be. Now this is a, this is a canyon a river is flowing through, and you've got this material here. These are slack water deposits. Okay, so these mark the highest elevation uh, of floods, and from these uh, from these deposits, uh, we can map elevations. In some cases, we're really lucky and get organic material. We can actually date uh, the uh, when uh, the floods occurred. Various other ways of uh, of dating if you have things like these ash horizons uh, from volcanic eruptions. Um, so we've got uh, we've got this tool, particularly. Um, in the uh, arid portions of the world, in the western United States, where we have the greatest uncertainty uh, in assessing magnitude and frequency of floods. This sort of evidence um, is uh, on the front line uh, in trying to characterize uh, how large floods can be and how big uh, we, need to, uh, we need to construct spillways uh, as a consequence. The, the, the procedure is, uh, once you do the mapping, it's, uh, it's just like what you'll be doing with the uh, uh, with the Lake Missoula floods. It's just Manning's equation. You know, you map uh, a water surface elevation, you have a high water mark, and you have a channel geometry. And bang, you know, you've got a, you've got a peak discharge. That's wonderful. Uh, that's absolutely wonderful stuff. Um, this is Vic Baker, um, who um, was largely responsible for the quantitative assessment of flooding. Um, uh, in, the, uh, in the Columbia Basin from Lake Missoula floods. Um, he was the one who had the idea that, by gosh, let's, you know, we've got all this information uh, on uh, maximum elevation of the floods. Let's put it together in a systematic way um, and just march forward with, uh, with Manning's equation. So he did that. He uh, initiated that in the, in the, uh, the late 1960s. Um, he's shown here uh, with a bunch of NASA <coughs> scientists, and they're out in the uh, the channel scabland of the Columbia Plateau, and you know what in the world is is uh, is Dick Baker doing with uh, with a bunch of uh, actually NASA engineers? Um, well, the Missoula floods um, they're the biggest on Earth, but they're they're just not the biggest in our solar system. The other thing Dick Baker liked to look at is floods on Mars, and this is an image. Uh, from the Viking program, and it shows one of the channels here for scale a thousand kilometers in length. So we have these Martian channels that are thousands of kilometers in length, uh, hundreds of kilometers in width, uh, and flow evidence suggesting uh, floods much larger than those that occurred uh, in the Columbia Plateau. And in fact, uh, the channel scabland of, uh, of eastern Washington is, is used as the Earth analog uh, for floods. Uh, for floods on Mars. So the, you know, the Lake Missoula floods, they're really big. They're probably the biggest things on Earth, uh, but they may not have been as large as, uh, as the floods that occurred in Mars. Uh, this is uh, from uh, uh, recent images from the uh, Mars uh, orbital mission. Um, let me see for scale. This is about uh, a little over uh, about 1,500 uh, uh, meters, a little over a kilometer. Uh, this is a blow up of it. You see these Martian channels. They're really, really deeply incised, huge channels. Uh, what in the world created those? Exactly what happened in the, in the Martian channels is, uh, uh, turns out to be a, uh, a much more of an open question. Now, uh, so you know, it all sort of comes back to um, uh, you know, John Wesley Powell's view, we had uh, catastrophism and, um, and uniformitarianism. And the, the, the problem that cropped up uh, with, uh, with the attacks on catastrophism um, was that, well, there, uh, there really are cataclysmic events that shape, um, that shape the features of land surface. Now those, you know, those cataclysmic events obviously also turn out uh, to be ones that are of, uh, of tremendous interest <coughs> for all manner of engineering uh, design problems. Uh, so we had, a, we had a paradigm that was created and it really needed some modification. The paradigm was strongly influenced by this, uh, by this uh, external issue that 
uh, that catastrophism was linked with, uh, with Noah's flood. Um, so in looking at, um, at both the, uh, the scientific problems that arise in characterizing um, uh, extreme flood events, uh, extreme natural hazards, um, we, ha we have to adapt our thinking uh, from that that was, uh, that was brought to bear uh, on J. Harlan Bretz in 1923. Um, we have to adapt our thinking quite a bit. Um, Robert Ballard is out in his little sub mapping shorelines uh, on the Black Sea. Robert Ballard, the, uh, the oceanographer who, uh, who finally got down to the Titanic. Um, well, you know, what he's looking for is he's looking for old shorelines. And they found these old shorelines. And here's the idea. The idea is that uh, the Black Sea about 7,500 years ago uh, was, uh, uh, there was no sea at all there. In fact, uh, there was, uh, sea level was much lower than it is currently, that we know now. Um, and it was really only with rising sea level uh, about uh, 6,000 years ago uh, that uh, floodwaters moved through the Bosporus into the Black Sea, creating this tremendous tremendous flood that inspired uh, the Sumerian legends of Gilgamesh and wound their way into Noah's flood. So see you next Thursday. <laughs>